Hello, welcome to another episode. I'm still debating about what to call this. I am sure by the time I have, <laughs> I would go to post these, I, something good will come to me. But let us welcome today Logan. Logan is a good friend of mine. He's a member of the group, though he has not been able to make it to any of the actual meetings. But Logan, would you like to welcome yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Logan. Um, I haven't made any meetings because usually I'm gaming (laughs) or working on something game related or working on my own podcast. Um, I was working up until recently. So this concept of free time is kind of a a weird thing for me. Yeah, I'm a big gamer, like D&D, tabletop style role-playing games. I do a gaming podcast. I'm also active within my Wiccan tradition. I just kind of tick a lot of those weird boxes, I suppose. <laughs> but yeah, I live here in New York. I just moved. Not to New York, I just moved to another place in New York. I don't know why I said that, but... Whatever, and I'm just kind of here figuring out my uh, what my life looks like in the midst of COVID-19. I think that's what we're all trying to do. So thank <laughs> you for finding a slice of your now bounteous free time, it sounds like, <laughs> to Surprisingly <sit> not. <laughs> like, I have found ways to fill my time, um, with the exception of, like, late evenings. Once late evenings hit, I just sit and watch TV till, like, 3 a.m., and feel like I'm not productive, despite the fact that I'm productive throughout the day. It feels like I'm supposed to be productive, like, 19 hours a day, and I kind of blame New York City for that. (laughs) Oh, totally. I completely (laughs) understand that, and also definitely agree on the issue of not having enough time, even while you are just collecting that unemployment check and trying to stay away from others during this quarantining season. Indeed. (laughs) Indeed. Well, since you are a gamer, I wanted to talk to you about these cross, well, the intersections between gaming and masculinity. You're a perfect person for this. So where do you see said intersection? Uh, It can be in gender philosophy, politics, what have you. Well, I mean, I think it's an interesting question. I think that gaming in and of itself by allowing you to adopt the role of someone else causes you at least in a perfect world to see a world um through eyes not your own especially when you get really involved with the game you start acting and making decisions that your character would make that when you reflect later go i wouldn't make that decision that's not necessarily my thought process and and i find that interesting so in terms of the intersection with the you know gender identity and gender expression um, and these codified societal things of what masculinity is, I think gaming really allows you to assess that and really delve into things, especially things that can sometimes make you uncomfortable. And I think the current game now is really conducive to that, especially when you start tapping into some of the like indie market stuff that is really, really being spearheaded and championed by the queer community especially, which is amazing and fascinating and I'm 100% on board with. Yeah, we both are familiar with a couple of designers. Uh, You definitely more so. You're deep into that community. And I know you design games a little bit yourself as well, or at least supplements for games so far. Do you, in that (laughs) process going behind the scenes for a moment in that process do you actively think about gender or masculinity when Um, creating in terms of some of the supplement supplemental things i've worked on it's not something that i've actively thought about i've written a few changeling the dreaming supplements (laughs) for the storyteller's vault and it started the big one started off as a project of revisiting this aspect of the game that was new but tying in my experience of the game that I've played since I was 15 and I'm 37 now which is insane (laughs) to think about the characters I've played over the years would fit into this idea and it's interesting that we're talking about masculinity because when I was younger I typically played female characters and I think that was largely because 
a female character was allowed to be more sensitive. So in working on this, I was playing, I played a lot with the idea on showing both male, female, and trans characters that were meant to illustrate certain aspects of what I was writing. Let me back up. I wrote a supplemental book for Changely and Dreaming about banner houses, which are like sub houses within the great houses of the ruling body of the character types, just to kind of give you some context. And I typically didn't really think about the gender of the example characters within each of these banner houses, unless it was very specifically to serve a point. I showed, but I also showed that there were positive and negative aspects to people of both genders, because I think in my mind with designing that, it was about showing this balance and that people can really surprise you, but also be really sensitive while also having really toxically negative traits. Not that I want people to be toxic or negative, but showing that people are multifaceted and nuanced. And in doing that with female characters, for me, then allowed me to do it with male characters too, because it's like I finally had permission to show a full rounded person in doing it with a female character and then moving it into a male character. It's like I was breaking down that construct, societal construct of what a person is and then getting into how I wanted people to be perceived. I'm not sure if that made sense. I went a little rambly there. <laughs> Let me see if I can, if I can pull apart what I think I'm hearing here. What I think I'm hearing is in the process of designing these supplements, you've had to examine the characters regardless of gender. And in doing so, that has informed your own play style in ways. Yes. And you were, because you were talking before about, and you cut yourself off, you were talking before about how you used to primarily or only play female characters you did not quite get into the crossover to male but i'm assuming this design was that crop helping hand in the crossover no well yes and no i mean nowadays and for the past i guess 10 years i primarily played male characters but i think in writing this supplement it really showed me why i was able to make that transition not that i'm like i made that transition years ago but i never really fully analyzed it and in writing this supplement, I was able to understand my rationale and why I did it, or why I was able to then transition from playing something that was safe to then playing something that is actually familiar. And I think that's an interesting, dis interesting viewpoint that playing the feminine was safe because it, because as a gay man myself, it was something that I could easily jump into and slide into and understand. But then jumping into it, like playing the familiar, as in playing a gay male character, I believe because I worked in that safety zone and understood how it worked, I'm not able to make a more nuanced performance, and I'm using air quotes here, while gaming, because of that breadth of knowledge. I'm using a lot of air quotes today, that breadth of knowledge that I have from my experiences. And from experiences as a player to experiences as someone who is running the game, known as a, a game master, GM for short, sometimes a dungeon master specifically to Dungeons and Dragons, what is that like when you have to play not one character, but multitudes of characters, and you are sometimes trying to play up an archetype, sometimes trying to portray a more rounded person? <laughs> I think it's interesting because a lot of times my perceptions of how a an NPC is being portrayed are vastly different than what the players are. We just had an example of this in a Changeling game where I, where I initially played this one character, but then brought in a player to play her. And she was actually not a villain, but everyone started assuming she was. And it was really funny. Also he means, frustrating. He means I started to assume she was a villain. I was. You were not the only one. You were <laughs> not the only one. Trey's just nicer about it. <laughs> I think it's important to not necessarily necessarily play into stereotypes because you don't want a female character who's just an uncontrollable shrew and i'm air quotes with that one too because that's not how women should be thought of or perceived in any capacity but you also don't want men to just be automatically trusted and or assumed to be the villain either i think it's really important as a gm 
for you to like your NPCs, even your shitty NPCs, because that makes them more believable. It makes their motivations. Like, you actually find justification for their motivations. Even if it's something completely deplorable, like, you at least understand why they're doing it. And I think understanding who your NPCs are, from, like, the smallest, like, bit NPC to, like, the villain of your arc, completely understanding who they are. And I think that that transcends gender. Because at the end of the day, they're still people, and we're all people. And yes, there are going to be things about being a woman that I will never understand, and there are things about being a man that a woman will never understand, and that's okay. But at the end of the day, we are still people, and our the drives that we have as humans can be shared. And I think that's important in, in kind of, I guess, detoxifying masculinity, is that men can cry and be sensitive and, and be hurt and react to that hurt, sometimes in inappropriate ways, but that same, like I was talking about, like sharing those human experiences, women can too. And understanding that because we both can do that means that we're not as different as we'd like to think we are. Beautifully said. Do you feel the gaming community, again, because you have been in it for so long and you have a history with it and you've also, I believe, have looked into the history of it. Do you see it embracing this these sort of progressive views of masculinity or humanity i i see it a lot in the indie circuit um with especially in the pbta or uh, belonging outside belonging communities or the lyric game community quick note pbta is powered by the apocalypse ah sorry <laughs> and then bob belonging outside of belonging is a derivative of powered by the apocalypse it's the diceless version of powered by the apocalypse um, those games would be things like Sleep Away or Dreams Askew, and then at Itch.co, which is a gaming community um, for all kinds of games. There's a lot of belonging outside of belonging and PBTA games there that you can kind of delve into and play with. It is really, from what I understand and have seen, spearheaded and championed and driven by the queer community, largely the trans community too. There, there's a lot of trans game designers out there who are absolutely incredible and it's amazing to see the way their minds work i'm like in awe of it every day but you also see some progressiveness in the more mainstream things onyx path for instance is really good about hiring people of color and trans and t queer writers across all their lines D, D has gotten for D, D remarkably progressive the problem i see is that you have a divide in the gaming community of player types you have the younger crowd and the queer community which is wanting to be super progressive and you have the older community which is largely male and white who are really bucking against that progressive trend let me add here this is my perception of it i'm sure others have different experiences and perceptions of it so i am speaking personally and solely from my experience to add to your perception of it i was at comic-con i think I think last year or the year before and Aisha Tyler was speaking oh, I love and she yes she's 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 quite amazing and she was speaking about when she was starting to get into the nerd geek whatever you want to call it community and she enjoys a good tabletop game from time to time wait wait a second wait a second before you come to the story <laughs> Aisha Taylor plays the like tabletop role-playing games yes <laughs> I need to go find her <laughs> i need to invite her to changeling like come play changeling with us it'll be fun <laughs> definitely <laughs> anyway <But> she... sorry <laughs> but to your point she was talking about this and, and she found she found it so strange that nerds geeks we are the ones who do this to, within this community because we gatekeep it and she <laughs> had a lot of problem with as you say the white male cis straight crowd sort of gatekeeping her out of these things that she was interested in she told a story about how she learned how to ride mo motorcycles from her dad and he would drop her off at school every day on the back of his and she learned you know how to do some light repairing on them and everything and because she really was into motorcycles she would try to talk about this she'd try to geek out with these other guys who were also into motorcycles and they would just kind of look at her like she was crazy because she's a girl. That was the only reason, right? And then, and same, in, and then she went on to get into like 
real nerd culture, Star Trek, gaming, uh, tabletop, what, whatever you, ha what have you. And she, she met the same resistance there and she, for the life of her, could not understand why. And she was railing against that and crying out for us to make sure that we don't do that. Well, it's interesting that you're bringing that up because there's also, and it's been, I mean, in the news a little bit and all over Twitter, um, I'm sure you all listening have heard of Gamergate and how, but, it, but from my understanding, that's like specifically related to video games at first glance, but there are so many, I'm going to use the word predators here because that's what they are. There, are, And I'm, so many is not the right word. There are predators within the tabletop gaming community that groom and really exercise their quote unquote authority and power because of who they are in the gaming community over women and queer people because they're allowed to. And it's like this weird old boys network. And that's why I'm so happy about the indie circuit because they're fighting so hard against that. And I think that's why so many people are gravitating now towards these indie games because it's fresh, it it's new, and it's you're allowed to exist in a safe space and explore things. And to speak to that, a lot of these games now, and you're seeing it start to trickle into mainstream games. These indie games have safety tools that they actively talk about in their books, and I think that is going to reshape how we game and why gaming is important and reshape how we view ourselves, but also how we interact with others. And I think that is the is one of the important issues, or not issues, but important topics to consider when you're talking about reframing what masculinity is. And, and it's like you see those memes about Mr. Rogers. No one can be mad at Mr. Rogers. He is like, he is completely like the perfect man, but he's not, but he doesn't exemplify any of those toxically masculine traits. But no one would ever deny that he is masculine, and I and I think that the indie gaming circuit, which I will always talk about ad nauseum, <laughs> kind of wants to showcase and exemplify because it, I mean, it's a it's a safe space is what I'm kind of all boils down to. I'm really rambly about this. I like to think about this, so I kind of my thoughts are going like a mile a minute. I apologize. <laughs> to take it to a mainstream point uh, and talking about. Dungeons and Dragons, which I think is arguably the biggest tabletop role-playing game out there. And when you think of Dungeons and Dragons, like the image that a lot of people have in their minds are a bunch of, you know, maybe teenage, high school age boys in their mom's basement, sitting around together, eating junk food and laughing it up. And usually white, I think maybe for the current generation with Stranger Things, because they have a they have the one token black kid there, maybe more mixed. But Dungeons and Dragons itself, in a huge, in a very interesting move for their most recent edition, which is the fifth edition that's come out since it started in the 70s. I can't remember the exact year. I think it was 73. Mm. So from then until this edition, which came out within the past five years, this is the most financially profitable edition since the first one. And a big portion of that they're claiming, uh, or why they're claiming this has been so profitable is because the narrative has been raised up to be the most important thing. Dungeons and Dragons still has a lot of these tactical, tactical. fights. Yeah. yeah. But because they're focusing on the narrative and they're focusing on the stories between the characters, they're finding that that is a, they're getting a lot of positive feedback about that. And that is allowing people to explore the idea of storytelling and jumping into different character skins. I, I agree with that. I also think in addition to that, you don't think about it necessarily, but there's a lot of art in gaming. And I mean like literal art in the books. And D and D with fifth edition showed a lot of different types of characters. You saw female dwarves, which you don't usually see. Um, I think there was a trans character in one of the books, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, I think it was the player's handbook. I'd have to go back and double check on that. But I think, I think the people that are designing this are trying to 
open it up, and I think the art is a very accessible way in which to do that, because as humans, I think we are largely visual creatures, and being able to see it, in some respects, is to understand it. I know they say don't judge a book by its cover, but you know what? We're going to. And that's both good and bad, I think. It depends on how what you do after you see something, I think. So in using the art, and using the art selectively and creatively and judiciously, you can change viewpoints. And, and honestly, we already know this. That's exactly what propaganda is. Propaganda doesn't have to be a bad word, I don't think. It, it, I think it depends on your ultimate intent. If you're doing it for the betterment of society, and I mean true betterment, not like pushing your agenda or trying to hurt others, there can be good aspects to it. And I think we see that in the way that the, the landscape of gaming is changing. I mean, I know that when I first started gaming, when I was like 15 or so, I didn't know any other queer gamers. I didn't know many female gamers. I didn't know many gamers of color. It was largely straight white men. And in the past 10 years, I don't think I know that many straight gamers anymore. Most of my gaming community is female, queer, people of color, and I am completely okay with that. Not that not that straight men aren't welcome at the table. You are always welcome at the table. You are never not welcome. But it's just nice to see that much more diverse crowd because not only are you playing a character that allows you to change your perceptions, but being around other people who are diver different from you lets you, once the game is over, and talking about that with your fellow gamers able to enhance and expand your own horizons and stuff it's i think it's really amazing well quick aside on that liam who we play with he is a he's straight if you did not know i did not know that but yes. cool well, i love <laughs> liam liam's wonderful yeah going back to playing these characters i have heard stories this is all hearsay when a <laughs> straight man would play a female character for specific nefarious reasons. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we've all heard stories about that. Um, I was going to ask if you have had, uh, maybe not, but ha if you've had to deal with that or something similar and how you dealt with it at that time. Um, I, it's in that same vein. I mean, I've seen straight men play female characters and usually, largely it's relatively benign. A little, sometimes a little cringe, a lot of times a little eye rolly just in how they choose to depict how a woman behaves. It's just kind of like, I don't know any woman that acts like that, but okay. This experience, again, it's in the same vein, but it was in an Exalted game many years ago, and the GM, who was dating one of my best friends at the time, he was a straight white guy, decided to have my character drugged and raped, and I couldn't do anything to stop it or resist it. And he thought that was fine. I did not think that was fine. <laughs> In fact, I was very upset about it. That said, a, a few moments ago I mentioned the safety tools. This was in a time where if they existed, they weren't being talked about as largely, and I didn't really... I was so blindsided by what happened, I didn't quite know how to react. If that happened now in a game, I can guarantee you I'd lose my shit. But at the time, I was also a lot younger. I was probably like only 20 at the time, maybe 22, somewhere in there. And still figuring out who in the hell I was, so I didn't even know what to do or say. But I think that's in that same vein of, like, straight men playing female characters for various purposes. He knew the power he had. He was the GM, and he was also the dominant culture within gaming. So to him, it was fine because, you know, it wasn't happening to him. He knew what story he was telling, etc., etc., etc. I think because of things like that, is why safety tools are so often discussed now, because I think there's so many people who have experienced stuff like that. When you're talking about Aisha Tyler, I'm sure she dealt with stuff like that. These like little microaggressions and major aggressions at times too, that we as gamers in today's climate now have a recourse in which to deal with. And, I, and I'm really happy about that. There's a rock on my floor. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, um, we Logan and I just wrapped up a game called Monster Hearts, and in it, it has exactly what he's talking about—a thing called an X card. 
And I was telling someone about this who is not a gamer, and they love the idea of an X card in general sort of everyday conversation, or maybe they were going to take it to, I, I can't remember the full extent of what we discussed, but they were interested in the idea of this X card where you're discussing something in the game that's happening, or you, even, maybe even before the game you discuss it, what topics are taboo? What are we not going to have in this game? What are we going to allow, but it should be off screen maybe? Things like that. Well, yeah, and I mean, I can give you an example. For me, I don't mind sex in a game, but I don't want to role play it out. Like, I will definitely veil that. Like, you can just fade to black. We all know what happened. We can use our imagination. You can write about it if you want on your own time. <laughs> I've seen it all. But it, it doesn't have to be anything like that, too. Like, I've seen people say, don't put any ethnic stereotypes in a game. And, and when you say it overtly, it gets respected. And I think it helps foster trust within a gaming group. I just wrapped up an Urban Shadows game with these uh, friends of mine in Canada, which sounds so weird to say, but like, <laughs> like we couldn't figure out what to do during the lockdown, so we all just started playing Urban Shadows. And we had a very short like lists of like for our lines and veils, but it was stuff like no ethnic stereotypes or I think one of the things was spiders, like just because someone cannot deal with spiders and that's cool. And I kid you not, this was one of the best games I've ever been in my life. We had such a blast. And I think it was a combination of us like really enjoying each other's company, but us also having very clear rules on what is and isn't acceptable. And like, <laughs> and once you define those rules and understand that, it, we, had, we had a blast. We had so much fun. We made the most inappropriate jokes sometimes, but we all knew that it was coming from a good place because we had that social contract in, in order. And we also understood that if something was said that did make someone uncomfortable, that we immediately discuss it and get it added to the list. So again, gaming became a safe place again. For me, being a white male, it was never largely unsafe. I have some experiences, so I do acknowledge my privilege in that. But it just became, as I can't describe it really, unless you've ever experienced it, it became a truly safe split, safe space. And yes, in Preston, your Monster Hearts game had that too. I just remember in the height of the pandemic reflecting on that so specifically with this group. It became like a very, like a beacon in my head almost. Earlier you were talking about going from female characters into male characters. What are some positive aspects of masculinity that you have been able to bring to these characters or that you like to exemplify or that you have seen others exemplify as a male presented um, character I think it, it might sound funny to say but there is an assertiveness and an implied confidence to a male character that I think can be very beneficial I think men are largely assumed to have authority how they choose to exercise that is where the toxicity comes in. But being able to have that safety net, I think, is somewhat nice. And I know it might sound weird to say, because I'm, 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 I'm feeling very clinical about saying that, but I think that can be a positive thing, is just knowing that you don't have to justify your assertiveness. If a woman is, is assertive, she's called bossy, but if a man is assertive, it's just him being masculine. And I think that can be a beneficial trait. I've seen female friends and female presenting fr friends who have played male characters who were then allowed to be assertive without it being qu questioned. I think that there is an aspect of that that can bring a lot of self-confidence because you finally are trusting in the validity of the things that you're saying. Let's see some other things. I think, I think you're allowed to explore different expressions of sensitivity and that it is okay to cry. Um, I've been moved to tears by characters before, um, male and female characters, and I think being able to adopt the skin of someone else and play into their emotions lets you examine yours, and then realize that, no, it's okay for a man to feel hurt and to have his feelings hurt and to understand why his feelings are hurt. Then tell me, who is the, your favorite character that you have ever played, if you can, if you can do that? <laughs> Wow. Okay. And of course, the obligatory I, why. And, and, and a 
in a, in a genuine Gemini fashion, I have a, a few. Um, one of them, it was my very first long-term character I played. It was Changeling the Dreaming. Um, and two of these are going to be female characters and one's going to be male. Her name was Rebecca. And of course, she had amnesia. And Like, okay, I was 15, so I went real extra with this, okay? She dated a prince who was named after a character from the Anne Rice Sleeping Beauty trilogy. Thank you. It was a Changeling of Dreaming character. She she was House Fiona, and then she became a Knight of House Skavik, and then she became Fiona again and a Baroness, and it, it was a wild ride. But I got to have fun with her. I got to... I got to really understand my own sexuality with her because it really, in some respects, allowed me to explore what having an attraction to men was. And I could do that safely because she was a female and that was accepted. Plus, she was also a badass. I got to be a badass warrior woman. It was cool. Years later, I played an exalted game and this was on a chat menu. And her name was Ani. And she was a 16-year-old gladiator. And... She just didn't care what people thought. And I, I myself still care what people think. It's something I work on. I don't know why I care about what so much, so much why people think, what people think of me. But she didn't. And whenever I got to play her, I got to escape that for a little bit and just go balls to the wall, so to speak. My most recent favorite character, however, was that Urban Shadows game. And I was playing a fae. He had run away from his court to live in the mortal world. His name was Chalk. And he was just a complete asshole. But like, but also a good guy. Like he ended up sacrificing himself to save the party and save the world from this fate entity that was gonna take it over. And he's now trapped in some weird nether region a la like Superman 2, like the mirror thing. He, it's, it's, a whole, it's a whole situation. But I got, but because of like, first, I, like with Rebecca, I got to play this badass warrior who got to understand my own sexuality and to playing Ani, who didn't care what people th think. I got to play Chalk, who was unabashedly gay, a little bit of a circuit boy, <laughs> but also a little bit of a fop. He was a person of color because the storyteller really wanted us to, while not playing into ethnic stereotypes, also understand that the world was diverse. So he was Indian, or at least Indian presenting because he was Fae and from fairy um i was kind of basing it off the, this whole idea of like titania um midsummer night's dream kind of aspects of things and he was unabashedly gay he was unabashedly trying to like save the world but on his own terms like it was very very much he was in control and he cared about people even when they thought he didn't because he would do stuff when he found stuff out he was a action-oriented kind of character where he would try to stop stuff from happening and he would piss off the other PCs. And we would joke about it after a game, like, he's really actually doing a good thing and everyone's like, we know, but he's not telling anyone about it, so he's looking like an asshole. But his heart was in the right place, and I think because of my experiences with other characters that I've loved, I was able to play him in this really nuanced, believable way where it's like, we all do these things where we think we're helping and our hearts are in the right place, but it actually is the wrong thing. Or it's the right thing at the wrong time. And yeah, I, so I think I think in exploring this, like, playing female characters and now playing male characters, it just lets me make a, a nuanced person who I'm portraying. It's almost like acting um, and really understanding the motivation behind your character and the why of what they're doing. So when you're playing it, it's not you, like running through like you know a list of things to do it's you in real time thinking as they think and behaving as they behave and yeah i think it's a beautiful thing to be fair audience it's not really real time case in point this thing that took 30 seconds in the games world probably took about 15 minutes of conversation in the real world that's usually about the time we're looking at here. You know, I don't know what you're talking about. It happens in real time with me. I don't... Whatever. <laughs> whatever. Whatever. <laughs> well, a little story time. Going off of the idea of masculinity, but bringing back that idea that you just brought to the table of being ethically diverse in your character choices, I recently played a, a game with Kat 
who is a GM and a player at my table with Logan. And it was a game of masks. And I decided to play a Palestinian man, or teenager, rather, in the 70s. And I went to a friend of mine who is Muslim, and I asked him, what should I be portraying in this character? And the best advice he gave me was just play him as you would play any other character. Play him as human. He, like, Yes, he has been affected by these things. Do your homework. Study what happened uh, in Palestine, in the rest of the Arab world, in the rest of the Muslim world at that time. How he's going to be perceived by an American audience. But play him as just, yeah, play him as you would if he were white. And I think that's the important thing. We as people do not exist in a vacuum. Yes, we are going to have cultural things from our upbringing that do shape how we perceive the world. But we also shape the world ourselves. And I think that that's the beauty of 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 this is that you get to create someone who is complex who does have weird hang-ups about things that you've never experienced but also who because they don't because they haven't actually interacted with something they really don't have a frame of reference for it so they don't really have an opinion about it and I, and i think that allows you to if you're doing it correctly to place something that is wholly different from yourself and the easiest thing to do is talk about playing a male character versus a female character but you can also do that with race sexual ex- like sexual identity um gender identity etc 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 yeah do your research but also understand that no one's perfect i think what i'm trying to say is that just do it do it with sensitivity and do it with honesty because as long as you're being honest If you make a mistake, people aren't going to get overly mad about you. And especially if you acknowledge that you made a mistake and learn from it and and change from it too. People respect authenticity. And I think that's what it boils down to is the authenticity part. Do you feel authentic or do you feel more authentic when you are playing a female versus a male character? Or in between or other? Nowadays, I feel more authentic playing a male character. And I think that's largely just because I know myself better. When I was younger, I felt more authentic playing a female character. And again, I think it comes down to that ability to be sensitive without judgment. That's how I've always viewed it. And people probably have different words for the exact same thing I'm saying, um, I'm sure. Or even different viewpoints on that. But I feel more authentic playing a male character these days. That said... I do, I mean, being a GM, I have to play female characters, and I I, I like to think that I make interesting female characters who have their own motivations and desires that aren't just like these caricatures of what I think a woman is. I'm sure I'm not always perfect, and I'm sure I will continue to improve. I'm speaking primarily from a player perspective on that one, so. Okay, you touched on this quite a bit, but how in a game, whether as a player or as the GM, can we make this a more inclusive space? How can we bring in the queer person of color to the cis, straight, white man to the same table and encourage them? Safety tools being a like you know the lack of them being a deal breaker um safety tools safety tools safety tools also i think there needs to be open communication especially between a player and the gm and if there is a problem between two players that the gm needs to be able to step in and deal with that sensitively and without judgment and I say that because yes there are people who do wrong and it's just overtly obvious that they do wrong but a lot of times 
something can be said and taken slightly out of context because someone's tone was slightly off. And so there can be two sides to a story um, where this, ev- people are remembering it accurately on both sides, but their perceptions of it are vastly different. So I do think when something happens that the GM needs to be able to, with again, without judgment, assess the situation and talk to everyone involved and, if need be, facilitate a conversation with everyone at the table. It, I know it sounds weird, and that's a lot of pressure to put on a GM. But when you use the safety tools and they're used appropriately, I have found that those issues largely vanish because people un- from the get-go understand what they're kind of getting into. So it boils down to the safety tools, which on my own podcast we talk about. I think we bring it up at least once an episode. Um, it is something we are very, 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 very cognizant of and we have an agenda with it. I'm not going to lie. We have an agenda. (laughs) And my agenda is that I want everyone to enjoy gaming and to not feel like they don't belong or that they can't be safe to explore something or that they can't voice their opinion without being completely dismissed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, safety tools, follow them. And since we're on the subject, tell us a little bit more about your podcast. How did it start? I know it's primarily about gaming, but maybe you'd like to expound upon that a little bit. Yeah, so it's called the Story Told RPG Podcast. Um, It's been going for two and a half years now. Um, It was me and my friend Chaz who started it, but he has stepped away now. And my buddy Griffin, who you've met Griffin... He's now stepped on board with me. We do a lot of Kickstarter promotions, so if you're like about to kickstart your game, we'd love to have you on and interview you so we can like time it up and with your Kickstarter launch so to kind of get you some more exposure there. We do interviews with game developers and game designers. I have since Chaz has left, um, he was a little bit more mainstream, and that's cool. I have started taking a little bit more of the indie route, which I'm really happy with, but I'm in charge now, so it's kind of my decision, and that's really exciting. We also do on opposite weeks because we release every other week, or every week. Um, we do actual plays. Right now, we're in the middle of a big Exalted campaign, um, which I get to play in, and that's fun. I'm playing a Wood Aspect who is misunderstood. <laughs> well, no, the funny thing is, in Exalted, the Dragon Blooded Society is matriarchal, so women, so women are the ones like who are the, the respected leaders and warriors, and men are kind of seen as like the arm candy and the ornamentation and the housekeepers, etc. And it's and it's interesting. Um, and I'm playing this socialite who is also extremely skilled in survival; like he can survive in the woods as well as court. And I'm really enjoying playing him because it's. It's allowing me to play a man in a different context, um, and I really enjoy that, and I really enjoy the character, and he is, he's just a delight to play. Becoming a favorite character, not one of my top favorite characters, but a favorite character. We've also done actual plays, like we did like a one-shot for masks. Um, In January, I'm taking the month off, and Chaz did an actual play with, for Bluebeard's Bride that we're going to be airing on the opposite weeks in Monday. Yeah, our episode's released Monday. Sorry, um, I misspoke there. And then we've done some deep dives into older gaming books where we go and explore like some of the things they're talking about in there. Like We've done a, quite a bit of Exalted. We've done a lot of Changeling the Dreaming. Looking at my gaming collection here. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's kind of the gist of it. Um, we used to do micro episodes for interviews. That was what we primarily did with the uh, Kickstarter stuff. But then um, that was just getting to be like six to eight episodes a month. And that was just exhausting. <laughs> We've also interviewed writers. Uh, we had uh, Shauna McGuire who wrote, who writes the October Day series. She came on and uh, talked about the parallels between her books and Changeling the Dreaming. That was very early on. But yeah, so we do, we do a little bit of a lot. Um, and it's kind of exciting because uh, two and a half years is a lot for a podcast. Yeah, most are most say what they need to say and then they sort of get out of the way. Um, I know a few creative ones that are still going on, but otherwise, uh, do you have a favorite podcast? 
<laughs> I do, but it has absolutely nothing to do with gaming. <laughs> it's the Loveville High podcast, and I think they're doing a season two. But it was, um, it's a musical podcast, so it's uh, nine episodes, and they're, each episode's about 10, 15 minutes long. And it's a musical about a very gay prom, and it is so delightful and wonderful and made me happy. And the music and the songs are really good, <laughs> and I just loved it. There's also a couple other ones that I listen to intermittently that are really good. And Counterparty is a D&D podcast that is like, I think it's set in the Ravnica setting. If I remember correctly, I haven't listened to it for a while, but um, it is a very, very good podcast. Yeah, and then I listen to lore a little bit, but I don't keep up with it. <laughs> There's a lot. The funny thing is, and I know this might sound awful to say, but because it takes me hours, and I mean like sometimes six to eight hours to edit an episode of a podcast and I release every week, I don't actually listen to as many podcasts as you think I'd listen to. I, I, I just, I get really tired with having headphones on. <laughs> That's not to say that there aren't amazing podcasts out there, and I do listen to some, I just don't listen to as many as people would probably think I do. Because I'm constantly editing or recording. Editing, recording, and also note audience, as a GM myself, and I'm sure Logan's going to agree, preparing for games also takes time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only laughing, Preston, because, like, while I do prepare, I wing it a lot. <laughs> like, I have notes. Like, I know where the story's going, but, like, I, like, when I ask for recaps, that's because that's because Logan needs a recap. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest about that, 100%. I mean, I know who my NPCs are, and I know what they're up to, but, like, the, it, like, the little nitty-gritty in-between stuff, I don't really plan for that. I plan the big, the big events that I want to happen. <laughs> And here's another note for you, audience. <laughs> GMs have different <laughs> methods of doing the same thing. No, no, absolutely. And I mean, and, and that's the beauty of it. Like, you kind of find your method to your madness, um, as it were. I mean, I, that, I think that's the, the fun thing about gaming is that you can really make it what you want it to be. And I think we were talking about how the gaming industry has, or how at least I perceive it's been changing in the past 10 years. And I think people got tired of not having a voice. And so there were some people in the community that said, you know what? No, I'm not doing that anymore. And it's gotten to the point where you see games like I Hunt, for example, which basically on like one of the first pages said, if you're a fascist, don't play this game. We hate you. That is almost a direct quote. And I am 100% on board with this. I mean, you also see things like Vampire 5th Edition, which had some controversy for, a, for when it initially came out with the way they were presenting some things. And the community said, no, 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 we're not playing that game anymore. And the creators had to adjust their tone. And it really pissed off some people. It really pissed off a lot of people. Because it was like, because people were still in that mindset, oh, it's Vampire, the Masquerade. It has to be a little edge edgelordy and it has to be dark. For the sake of being dark. And you know what? You can be dark without having to be morally reprehensible. Yeah. I think I think we sort of achieved that in <laughs> our in our recent Monster Hearts game. Like you're all playing monsters, you're you're killing people, you're casting hexes on innocent people, but you know, you're there's always a bit of gray area there. It's always like, well, is this person that this is happening to really so innocent? <laughs> Part of playing a character sometimes, people do have the choice to choose to be, in D&D terms, an evil character. And I think the term evil is slowly on its way out. But you can make choices that might be morally questionable. And as we have been discussing, it's a great arena to examine these moral iffy areas. I'm currently playing a drag queen who wants to become a drug lord in, a, in one of my games. And, you know, you usually think of drag queens as bubbly and funny, and she's kind of that, but then she also just last night stabbed a guy through his leg so that he wouldn't be able to move. <sighs> okay, fair. Like, we played a Geist game, and I was playing a, um... Wow, I was actually playing a drag character as well. 
in that game. Interesting. And he was, and his husband had died. I mean, it was, and that it was, this was largely on why he was like a, a sin eater. Um, if you're not familiar with Geist, it's people who have died and then connected with a spirit and come back, and now they can see ghosts and interact with ghosts. And he was looking for his husband, but there was the villain was killing ghosts to save his mother somehow. It was like the whole convoluted thing, and it made sense in game, but to explain it would take like way too long. And this character, who is by and large a decent person, ended up accidentally, well, so not accidentally, he knew what he was doing, but it was, it was the heat of the moment, ended up shooting the villain in the head so the villain didn't kill his friends. What my character did was wrong, <laughs> was very wrong, but it was also contextually, in my mind, the only recourse open to him based on how he was perceiving the thing, uh, the situation. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I get a little touchy when it's, when you say the evil is disappearing. I think that evil has a place. I think playing an quote unquote evil campaign can be interesting if done right. Safety tools, again, important for that. But I do think that there needs to be an understood idea that evil is evil and that uh, let's not yin yang everything, um, so to speak. I, I think that's a dangerous, dangerous slope. To, and I'll be quite frank, put us in the situation that this country is in now. But I do think also to, to, to that point though, that gaming lets you examine that a little bit and playing someone who is evil like holy evil can be productive if done correctly i, feel I like think you're absolutely a lot of topics on that one <laughs> yeah no i i, I no I, I think you're absolutely right and I, I i was looking at it purely from the stand i think i was thinking more about the word evil is sort of on the way out and this, fair fair yeah I did and that. because i was just thinking about the old uh so dungeons and dragons first came out had this grid oh and... i love the alignment system i know everyone <laughs> hates it now but <laughs> well, well let's explain what it is first yeah. and then then you gather your thoughts while i explain it so the alignment system goes between good neutral evil on the top and then on the side you have lawful neutral and chaotic and so you are a cross hair of two of these combinations you can be lawful good to chaotic evil you can be chaotic good you can be lawful evil and we're in there as well go ahead logan with your thought people like to rag on it and i get it i do like it's not like a great way to define an, a person's entire moral compass however however when you're building a character and other games have done this in different ways, like White Wolf used to do nature and demeanor. Um, Changeling, for example, has legacies. I think the alignment and legacies, or your moral barometer system, gives you a place to contextually weight your characters so you at least, when you're first playing, understand how to play them. A lot of times nowadays, because that has largely been removed... And this might be a me thing. I'll own if this is a me thing. Without having that alignment kind of idea built in, it sometimes takes me a little while to find a character's voice. I don't think that you should be so hidebound to your alignment or your nature and demeanor that it keeps you from exploring what the game is presenting you. But I do think that contextual weight is important. It's my same argument for meta plot and settings. I like metaplot. I like a story in a game that's already kind of existing in the background. If I choose to interact with it, that's my choice. If I don't, it's still there, but it's not affecting me. I think giving a contextual weight to a game allows you to make a character that lives and breathes and exists in the world you're you're given. Um, and I think that's why whenever I play Changeling, I like write up the entire court and all the commoners, so people see who's around there and can ask questions about who these people are. That way they know when they place their character in the world that they're not just an island. 
Now, Logan has in the past told me that Changeling is probably his favorite game. <laughs> Fair? True? Uh, it's in the top five. Well, probably even top three. It has a special place in your heart because it was your first game. Yeah. And in that game, I... Not as familiar with it. I've only played the one time with you as my GM. And when I say one time, I mean this was over weeks and months. But I definitely am not as familiar with it. And in that game, they do have this aspect... Well, first off, I don't think we've actually discussed entirely what Changeling is. If you could not guess from the game, it is based around the Fae. Uh, pre predominantly Fae of a Western fairy tale nature uh, with their court system. And that is brought out in gameplay. And that is what we've been talking about or Logan has been talking about yes. as the courts. And interesting that it has these courts because at court life, Western court life is very leans very heavily on these roles of what women and men are supposed to do. Does that did it maybe maybe not in this edition, but maybe previous editions was that a factor, or has uh, it ever come up in a game that you played? Gender politics and changeling. In terms of my experience and the books and what's written in them is relatively small. Players made it bigger than I've seen, or rather, I've seen players make it a bigger deal than the books presented it as. You had female NPCs in very large, predominant positions of power. You did still have the High King, who was male. And that maybe could be argued that that's like, you know, just a little too heteronormative, pa patriarchal. He, even though he was more like allusions to Arthur in some respects. Changeling gender politics didn't really play into it much. And I actually have to give White Wolf, now Onyx Path, some credit for that. That they've always been pretty good about that. Vampire, like gender doesn't matter when you're sucking someone's blood. Um, that's Vampire the Masquerade. Werewolf the Apocalypse, you had the Black Furies, for instance, who were a tribe of women. You did have the Get of Fenris, who were very patriarchal and man-first, but that was, like, I think, meant to more illustrate a point rather than to be any kind of some personal aspiration. I can't think of really a lot of gender politics in Mage or Wraith, and I don't really think the Chronicles of Darkness really played into it all that much. In fact, they I think they played into it even less so because they removed a lot of the meta plot from stuff. Exalted, the realm was matriarchal and the most powerful person in the world was a, a woman. And again, in my experience, the gender politics of gaming were largely player created. And I'm seeing that shift now. Um, especially as I've said with the indie uh, gaming community, really being cognizant of that. Do you want to highlight uh two or three games that if say this group it detoxifying masculinity wanted to have a subsection that went off in was a gaming group a tabletop gaming group are there two or three games that would be interesting to specifically focus on the issues around toxic masculinity actually Logan you know, is currently looking over his bookshelf of 50,000 plus books. I don't okay. have 50,000 gaming books. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> it's going to be hard to find and you're probably only going to find PDFs. However, if you want a game that really explores gender politics, look at the game Tribe 8 by DreamPod9. And it... It's a post-apocalyptic fantasy game. Um, I'm actually working with some people to develop it into a Forged in the Dark system, which is its own kind of um, its own kind of kettle of fish, so to speak, or kettle of worms. I'm not, I can't remember the expression. But Tribe 8 is a post-apocalyptic, very spiritual-oriented game about humanity that has just been freed from enslavement. They were freed from enslavement by avatars of the goddess. The tribes that lead the people are led by women, and women are the predominant force of power within the game. There are exceptions to this for specific NPCs. Um, but as a player, you play someone who's banished from your tribe and trying to 
realize what your own destiny is. And I think if you really want to explore something about detoxifying masculinity, look at a game where women are at the forefront and where women are making the decisions and where women rule the world for lack of a better expression because it's going to force you to examine your own biases that you don't even necessarily know you have. Exalted, a dragon-blooded game specifically, especially one set in the realm, is also going to do that because, like I mentioned earlier, women are the warriors, women are the leaders, women are the bureaucrats, women are the politicians, and men are somewhat secondary and subservient to it. There's even like a big sidebar in there about having to reframe that. So look at games in which women are in power because then you're again like i said a moment ago you're going to have to readdress your own biases and you might have things that surprise you for good and bad i know that sometimes in exalted i get a little frustrated when it's like when a character gets frustrated and gets emotional all of a sudden like oh you're just like a man being so emotional and having to like sit back and go whoa I've never, like, actually told a woman she's being emotional when she's upset. People are allowed to be upset. (laughs) But having to, like, hear that, in my mind, is, like, being told, you'd be so much prettier if you smiled more. It's it's just kind of having to, like, be, like, forced into, like, seeing, oh, wait, this is what that's like? I don't like this. I don't like this at all. And kind of change your behaviors, even if they're small microaggressions, just being cognizant of it is really beneficial. Beautifully said. Well, I think we're coming up on time here. Is there anything else you would like to add to this conversation? Uh, no, I think I'm okay. (laughs) I didn't, I was actually surprised. I didn't know we'd go for an hour. I was like, I was like, I don't know if I have much to say about this, but okay, I'll come on. Here we go. (laughs) And lo and behold. Lo and behold. And anything that you're working on that we haven't already plugged that you would like to plug? Oh, yeah. So (laughs) I've just finished outlining and I have to start writing my own game. I'm calling it Haven. And it's about reclaiming queer legacy after an apocalypse. And it's going to be super fantastical and magical and if it all works really wonderful and as soon as i get it written i'm going to start planning out how i want to kickstart that and getting it illustrated and published so that's on my agenda for the next few months <laughs> awesome uh if you need any help play testing i am down for it uh what do you know what system is going to use or are you creating one <sighs> Um, well, it started off powered by the apocalypse. I'm kind of wondering if it needs to go diceless and be belonging outside belonging. But then I have a friend that keeps talking about Cortex Prime that I don't know much about, so I'm still learning about that, so I can't really answer any questions about it yet. But it's super modular is what I do know, so I might make it a little crunchier and go that, but we'll see what happens. I haven't fully decided. I need to actually do a little bit of research on that, but most likely powered by the apocalypse, (laughs) just because I know I can make that work. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, Logan. I hope thank this you. introduction into the group means that either A, some of them will reach out to you, or B, if you, now that you have the time, can come to a meeting, then yeah. people will already know who you are and can be like, hey, that's that cool kid, Logan. I, I, Hey, I've been wanting to get into gaming for a long time. How do I do that thing? <laughs> I don't know if I would ever attribute the word cool to me, but thank you. <laughs> I, <laughs> I am very weird. Um, cool, cool and weird can go hand in hand. You can, you can be both. Sure. Okay. I'll be cool and weird. Or as Eddie Izzard once said, it's like, it's like the cool, coolness meter is really a, it's really a circle. And you're like, you're cool, you're cool, you're kind of okay. Uh, you're looking like a dickhead, looking like a dickhead, and back to cool. Can someone send that memo to John Mayer? <laughs> too much? Too much? I will, I, I'll get right on that, Charlene. Charlene? <laughs> okay, she's, she's not listening. Never mind. Oh, uh, I will, just to like leave her, he is my guilty pleasure. I know he is awful, but his voice is so dreamy. Oh. It, well, what about, I, I, and I don't know anything about this person other than dreamy voice, but what about Josh Groban? 
Yeah, he doesn't do it for me the same way, but yes. <laughs> I fully understand my crush on John Mayer's voice is entirely problematic. I'm I'm working on that. <laughs> I'm working on that. We, Anyways. Can, we contain multitudes, friends. <laughs> we contain multitudes. Well, thank you for having me on, Preston. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> I have thoroughly enjoyed this. And we will keep gaming together. And if you guys want to know more about that, again, just ask. Yeah. I'm, right. I'm always around. I answer most messages. So reach <laughs> out. I'm, all, I'm happy to talk to anybody. <laughs> again, I'd like to give a special thank you to Logan for being a guest here on Masks of Masculinity. That was Logan Rollins, gentlemen and ladies. He is a member of the Detoxify Masculinity NYC group on Facebook, and you can find him on Twitter and Instagram as at Camera Obscura 83. That is at Camera Obscura, the numbers eight and three. And you can follow his podcast social media on Twitter as at Story Told Pod and on Instagram as at Story Told Podcast. On the next episode, I'll be speaking with one of the founders of Detoxifying Masculinity, Jack Sislak. Until then, if you're man enough for you, you're man enough for us. <laughs> <laughs>